Hello and welcome to The Rogers Brief. I'm Adam Rogers. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening. Just finished uh, watching day 25 of the Mass Casualty Commission proceedings. It was a fairly long day, went, uh, relatively speaking at least, went till just before 5 p.m. here on uh, May 18th. And it involved two witnesses who testified together. They were Staff Sergeants Jeff West and Kevin Surrett, uh, both of whom were uh, critical incident commanders on the night of, uh, well, the overnight hours of uh, April 19th, uh, 2020. Now, uh, both were uh, Staff Sergeants at the time. They are now both retired Staff Sergeants, so uh, we're seeing a pattern here. Uh, yesterday we had retired Staff Sergeant Steve Halliday. The day before that it was retired uh, Corporal uh, Tim Mills. We're seeing uh, uh, some significant uh, number of retirements uh, among the senior rankings of the RCMP in Nova Scotia following the mass casualty or in the intervening time between the mass casualty and now. Uh, it seems unusual uh, and certainly not a coincidence perhaps uh, resulting from uh, the events um, and maybe reflecting a lack of uh, confidence in the command decisions taken at that time uh, although uh, you think also from the citizens perspective maybe that's clearing uh, the deck a little bit for new blood uh, new commanders uh, supervisors to take those roles or take on roles of a similar nature depending on what emerges out of this so the uh, two staff sergeants uh, testified together as i said there was uh, no reasons offered early on uh, in the introduction by uh, commission lawyer roger burrow as to why they were testifying together certainly they were working together over that night but uh, testifying together especially these two commanders so Staff Sergeant Jeff West was the critical incident commander. So he, in other words, he was in charge of operations overnight from the time he arrived at 1 p.m. on, or sorry, 1 a.m. on the overnight hours of the 19th until the incident was completed. Uh, he was he was there. I think officially uh, he he left command uh, around 10 a.m. or so that morning, but uh, he was there. And his uh, and Staff Sergeant Surrett was there in support as sort of a, a bench coach. If, uh, if you're thinking in baseball terms, you have your manager and then you have your bench coach next to him who's basically uh, qualified to be a manager who's just there to sort of support and give advice and uh, filter or triage some of the information that would be going to the actual commander, Staff Sergeant West. So, uh, yes, they work together, but having them testify together really gave a sort of an un, unfair, um, improper sort of effect of reaffirming or giving artificial credibility to some of the answers because uh, one would answer and then the other would say, well, what do you think? Well, yes, I agree. Well, what do you think? Yes, I agree. So there was a lot of agreement that went back and forth. And I think it has, uh, you know, it, uh, it, it has an artificial effect of adding credibility. So I'll make that point especially where command decisions are under the, the microscope. Uh, I think having separate testimony from these, uh, in particular, these officers who were commanding operations uh, would have been more appropriate. In any event, they were there and they testified together today. They answered questions from Commission Counselor, Counsel Roger Burrell. They also answered uh, questions from Matt McClellan, from Patterson Law, from uh, Josh Bryson, from Chester Law, Tara Miller, from MDW. Uh, we got our first look at uh, my friend Tom McDonald, who was part of the Desmond Inquiry, uh, representing the Borden family. At that point, he's now involved in the mass casualty as well. And then we also had a few questions from uh, Patricia McPhee, the lawyer for the, uh, one of the lawyers for the Federal Department of Justice. Perhaps in reaction to some criticism uh, that I've been giving and others about the uh, Federal Department of Justice uh, seeming uh, lack of uh, participation, uh, particularly with their own witnesses, RCMP uh, supervisors. So over the last few days, they hadn't asked any questions. Today, today they asked a few. They were mostly sort of softball supportive questions, but at least they stood up and asked some. Then the commissioners also had a few questions at the end, commissioners uh, Stanton and uh, Fisk. 
bitch. So it was uh, a full day in uh, in certainly in time. Uh, we got some interesting answers and, and topics covered as well. So I'm going to talk about uh, those. Uh, the uh, First thing, okay, so these were the commanders. They One was coming, uh, Staff Sergeant West was coming from Halifax. Staff Sergeant Surrett was coming all the way from Yarmouth. There are uh, two of, uh, I think, six or so officers in the province, RCMP officers, that is, who are trained as critical incident commanders. And they talked about how they uh, came to the Great Village Fire Hall nearby, uh, close to port set up a command center there and then uh, coordinated resources uh, spoke to the staff sergeants spoke to the emergency response uh, team uh, head that was uh, corporal mills and dealt with things in that uh, sort of a, a command triangle as they described it so one of the th issues that came up a, a few times today was the uh, usefulness of a uh, mobile or uh, ad hoc command center why have a new one every time that there is a critical incident you know rather than having a centralized command post sort of those uh, you know the situation room kind of thing that you see on uh, in tv and movies uh, where everybody's in a room there's a whole bunch of screens and uh, technology and they can track and coordinate from there they come with the technology, travel to the scene, and then set up there. Well, it was an issue because in this particular place, there wasn't great cell service, as you might expect, in rural Nova Scotia. And so there were some problems getting through on the radio. I'm not sure the usefulness, uh, and it wasn't clear, certainly after the, the evidence today, the usefulness of going each time and setting up that mobile command center. Um, you're not on the scene you're still looking at a screen and on the phone and on the radio so that travel time seemed like it was an issue it was at least an hour they didn't uh, you know staff sergeant uh, west uh, didn't get there till 1 a.m you know two and a half hours after uh, things got started so uh that seems to be an issue you know the it it reminded me, I said in the uh, the piece, the written piece that I've just completed, it reminded me, if you ever, anybody's old enough to have watched uh, the Monty Python, The Meaning of Life, the first scene you may remember is a scene of two doctors assisting a lady giving birth, and they bring in this machine and that machine and this expensive machine and everything else into the room, and then so when the hospital administrator arrives, he's very impressed that they've used all of these things. Uh, and the, the, the woman herself is relegated to a uh, secondary status. Well, here you have a critical uh, incident commander. They set up the command post. They bring everybody in. There's, you know, half a dozen staff sergeants who are coordinating and they're briefing one another. They're talking to the inspectors. They're doing all these things. Uh, they've got the equipment. Um, it just it, it seems like a lot of effort without a real purpose to it uh, it seems like it would make more sense to have that command post as a, a, you know, a consistent place with consistent reliable technology available rather than counting on that being able to set that up in the local fire hall legion uh, or a side of the road as it may be uh, in in these situations so that was one issue. The other is uh, there's a, a you know command structure here, which seemed to create a lot of distance between the information that officers were receiving directly from people such as Andrew McDonald uh, and others, you know, about critical information such as the name of the killer, where he was, what he was driving, what he had done, the Blueberry Road, all of this information, which was known to officers on the ground, like Stuart Purcell, others that were uh, in port pick immediately, was not passed up the chain to Staff Sergeant West, who was making all of these critical decisions. So uh, that seems to be a, a major issue as well, and calls into question the need for this hierarchical structure, which uh, seems to slow things down and, and seems to be almost necessitate somebody's going to be making decisions based on uh, you know not enough information or not all of the critical information so yes they uh, they they call everybody in and uh, then they were set up and they were 
taking command of the situation. So, of course, uh, overnight, as we heard yesterday, the, the police felt as though Wartman was still in the port pick area and didn't, uh, you know, it didn't uh, clue in that he was gone until uh, Ms. Banfield emerged uh, from the woods and started giving her statements and then uh, some other information was received and then, of course, they, they get the call about Miss Campbell. So there was uh, some questions about that and coordinating the response uh, through these uh, the staff sergeants. Now, the staff sergeants are both retired, but I would suggest that they took more of the stance of Steve Halliday yesterday of still supporting the RCMP response uh, rather than the approach of Tim Mills on uh, Monday of being highly critical, critical of the response. You know, they uh, even... So uh, I want to talk about the communications in a moment, but even the issue of the helicopter, which seems obvious that it would have been very helpful, uh, they really refused to admit that the helicopter would have made a difference. They said, well, any tool would be helpful, but they wouldn't go that extra step of saying, yes, that would have made a difference, even though, you know, it wasn't their fault that the helicopter wasn't there. So that was peculiar. Uh, talking about messaging to the public, well, here as another sort of bureaucratic situation. There was uh, Leah Scanlon, who was the officer on the scene that was supposed to be looking after communications questions. Well, okay, so Scanlon has to ask Staff Sergeant West uh, whether some communication can go out. Staff Sergeant West delegates it to Staff Sergeant Halliday. Staff Sergeant Halliday delegates it to Staff Sergeant McCallum. And then there's a, a communication up the chain to Inspector uh, Chris Leather, or Superintendent Chris Leather. So there's all of these calls going back and forth without uh, just the simple information being released, released to the public. It was the same kind of situation when they were deciding whether to call in the Earth Squad. Well, you know, Sar Staff Sergeant Halliday contacts Staff Sergeant, talks to Staff Sergeant West, talks to, to Inspector Campbell, who uh, then calls in... Uh, Corporal Mills. So there's a lot of phone calls, a lot of uh, sort of back and forth briefing about the situations and all those things. So uh, the <laughs> really, I, I really like the way Josh Bryson asked these questions and when he had his chance to cross examine about the uh, communications. So there was a tweet that went out at 11 32 p.m. on the night of the 18th that, you know, basically said there was a, you know, a firearms complaint. So it doesn't say anything and there was no update to that information overnight. So Staff Sergeant West justifiably says, well, that w tweet was issued uh, when, you know, when I wasn't there yet. I wasn't yet in command, so I can't take responsibility for that. Yes, okay. But then Josh Bryson asks, well, that was the only public communication throughout the night until, uh, until later in the next morning. And so that's all the public knows. And is that, do you think that reflects what the situation and the seriousness of it? And... Staff Sergeant West wouldn't directly answer it, which of course is an answer in itself when you don't directly answer a question. But he says, well, you know, he started answering, well, I don't know how he started, you know, he doesn't know much about social media and all this stuff. Well, that really wasn't the point. It was the content of the, uh, of the communication that was, he was being asked about. And I'm sure he knew that. So, uh, he refused to admit the obvious about those communications, that it was incomplete at best. And, um, really, uh, perhaps actively misleading as well. So uh, those uh, those issues, which seem like obvious ones, were not, uh, they wouldn't admit to. Some notable questions as well from Tara Miller, who also cross-examined about the McNeil report, which arose out of the Moncton shootings. So she was asking uh, Staff Sergeants West and Sorette about their familiarity with this report. And they gave the kind of answer that you'd give if your teacher asks you if you've read your uh, chapter for, you know, if you, you've read your material for the day. Well, I read part of it. Okay, so if you ask me about anything, I can say, well, I didn't read that part. They weren't, uh, they, seems like they hadn't read it. It was never the subject of any training or organized, um, you know, uh, conveying of information or the recommendations from that McNeil report, even though it was there's no such thing as identical situations, but it was an active shooter situation. RCMP officers were involved, targeted a big operation. You would think they, as critical incident commanders, would want to know those uh, issues and recommendations uh, fairly well. 
but they showed a complete lack of curiosity about it. It seems like the RCMP overall may have had a complete lack of curiosity about that report. So it certainly doesn't bode well for whatever may emerge from this uh, process as a report from the Mass Casualty Commission. In other words, uh, it doesn't inspire confidence that the RCMP will review the recommendations and implement any meaningful changes as a result. So uh, just something to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, like I said, uh, there were other questions from uh, Tom McDonald, from uh, Patricia McPhee and, and such, but uh, those were uh, some of the really key points. I felt these officers were really, uh, though they are retired and free to speak their minds, uh, were determined to suggest, as Sergeant Halliday did, Staff Sergeant Halliday, that uh, things went as well as we could, given what we knew and uh, capabilities. And um, So... Uh, really shows a, I thought a lack of insight into it and uh, just a, an attempt to protect uh, protect the brand so that was uh, those were the critical incident commanders and there was uh, lots of lots of interesting discussion today but those are some of the highlights from it and uh, now next uh, there's no no proceedings tomorrow the next uh, proceedings are going to be taking place uh, next week on the 25th and there will be in Truro we don't quite know what is going to be taking place then it's not listed on the Mass Casualty Commission calendar the commissioners at the end of the day today didn't explain what was going to be taking place so uh, we'll see once that is out I'll, uh, I'll sort of publicize that on Twitter if I can and uh, well once I know another thing just to note if anybody uh, in Cape Breton is uh, looking for something to do on Saturday afternoon uh, Paul Palango uh, and Jordan Bonaparte and I are doing a an event to promote Paul's book and uh, that's going to be at uh, the old Sacred Heart School in in Sydney uh, sponsored by uh, on paper books so a uh, good event to attend if you're there look for it uh, through Jordan or myself's uh, Twitter account and you'll see the link to that so uh, all right that's it for today thank you for watching uh, thank you for listening and we will see you next time